In this video, I'll discuss the surprising gut health superfood that aids rheumatoid arthritis naturally. You'll want to stick around for this one. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Chanu Dasri. I help my clients solve their immune inflammation and digestive dysfunction using the mind-gut immunity method. This clinical approach has helped thousands of patients resolve their symptoms in as little as six weeks without the need for complex or costly interventions. If you're serious about finding a lasting solution for rheumatoid arthritis and achieving results fast, check out the link below. You'll go to a page where you enter in your email to receive a free training where I walk you through the protocols that have helped my clients with rheumatoid arthritis achieve health within six weeks. Everything you need to know is there, including free guides, tons of helpful case studies. I'm going to show you the science behind superfoods and why they actually work for healing the gut. In addition, I'm going to give you some very useful tips on how to start incorporating this into your diet and how to plan your approach for addressing rheumatoid inflammation. Now before we go any further, don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell to keep up to date. These are must-see videos for anyone with rheumatoid arthritis looking to reverse their symptoms for good. And it's really helpful information that you probably won't get anywhere else. Now a little bit of background. The mistake I see most people make is that they think all food is created equal and that they can just eat whatever they want and expect their rheumatoid arthritis inflammation to go away. While everyone may be different, the truth is there are some significant ways to decrease inflammation on your own within your control which greatly impact rheumatoid arthritis symptoms. One way, the best way, is to improve your gut health. This is what I teach in my clinic and the material you're about to watch is taken straight out of my Mind Gut Immunity Academy where people just like you learn how to beat their rheumatoid arthritis symptoms for good, even when the diagnosis is unclear. Remember that the gut contains over a trillion immune cells. That's trillion with a T. So certain conditions which are caused by immune inflammation have a strong relationship with gut health. Now, to understand the topic of gut health, there are a few useful concepts I'll share with you in this video. Now, I want to introduce you to a concept called intestinal transit time. This is the amount of time it takes for food to travel through the GI tract. Usually food will travel through the small intestine in four to six hours and the large intestine in about 12. But let's say you're constipated and you have bacterial overgrowth, then sometimes it can take several days or up to a week to get through. Lingering foods is a term I came up with to describe any type of food that lingers in the intestinal tract for too long. This list includes meats, cheeses, sugars, and simple carbs like flour or bread. Now, how long is too long? Well, anything more than 12 hours, which means you should aim to produce stool multiple times a day. Two to four bowel movements a day is ideal and normal around the world and in our own human history. When we were foraging for food, our ancestors went two to four times a day. Nowadays, in developing countries, we're lucky to even go once a day. Some of my clients who suffer from bacterial overgrowth, IBS, and constipation sometimes only go a couple times a week. All of these folks have problems with inflammation, fatigue, stress, and it's pretty bad. So why do these foods linger? Remember, I said the list includes meat, dairy, processed grain, and sugar. This is directly related to the amount of fiber in these foods. And when I say fiber, most people think of Metamucil, or this thick powdery stuff we mix into water and drink. But when I'm talking about fiber, and particularly insoluble fiber, I'm talking about that chewy fibrous material in plants and vegetables. For example, celery, when you chew it and chew it, you're left with this material that you, can really, you can't really break up and you just end up swallowing it. Same thing with broccoli and kale and carrots. It turns out this fibrous material is not digested in the intestines, but it does two things. One, it pulls in water, making the bowel movements nice and soft. Two, it prevents the growth of bad bacteria in the intestines and the colon. That's why you hear a lot of people talk about fiber as being a prebiotic, because it basically sets up your intestines for success by harboring good bacteria. And by the way, there's nothing special or profound about prebiotics. So don't get tricked by the marketing. All prebiotics are basically fiber and you should be getting enough of it from your diet. I think fiber is very underrated and should be considered an essential nutrient. And because it's only found in plants, it's considered an essential phytonutrient. So what are some examples of high fiber foods? 
here they are. The list includes things like sprouts, microgreens, broccoli, celery, carrots, dark berries like blackberry, blueberry, and elderberry, avocados, almonds, pecans, and walnuts, lentils, beans, and peas, quinoa, and turnips and beets. These foods, by the way, should comprise 75% of what you eat so that you know that you're getting enough fiber every day. So I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to go into a little bit more in depth here and discuss the concept of fiber ratios. In my opinion, if you can understand this concept of fiber ratios, you'll understand the basis of almost every single weight loss diet ever invented. I included it here because it will help you judge what types of food you should focus on to achieve the desired goal. It would also be an eye-opener into the world of fitness and nutrition. Our ancestral diets, back when we used to gather our food from nature, consisted of 100 grams of fiber. Now, we're lucky if our diet has 20 grams of fiber, considering all the packaged and processed foods we eat. And when I'm talking about fiber, I'm not talking about the powdery stuff you mix into water and try to chug before it congeals. I'm talking about the fiber you have to chew, chew, chew in order to swallow. An example would be celery or cabbage. Why does this matter? Our intestinal system functions well when it has one gram of fiber for every 20 calories instead of one gram of fiber for every 100. And with that fiber, you need to also drink lots and lots of water, almost a gallon a day, because the fluid and the fiber is retained in the food waste and gets expelled and dumped out quickly from the body. Fiber ratios are very important because they basically dictate how well your bowels function and how much inflammation is produced in your body. If you have high amounts of inflammation, then your disease worsens and you gain a lot of weight and you keep it on instead of burning it off. So with that being said, we should in an ideal world aim for one gram of fiber for every 20 calories. And this is very hard and next to impossible for most people. I myself rarely hit this target. So I might just say to myself, let's just try to get 40 to 50 grams of fiber a day. And by the way, if you're at a 2000 calorie diet, that translates to one gram for every 40 to 50 calories. The FDA thinks 28 grams per day is enough, but I think 40 to 50 should be your target. Keep in mind, that's still one half of the fiber that our ancestors used to eat. You can never really have too much. So let's get back into it. After about four hours, the food waste gets metabolized by intestinal bacteria. The first time it gets metabolized, they create primary metabolites. These primary metabolites become food for a second population of bacteria which then creates secondary metabolites, and so on and so forth. This set of bacteria, the ones doing the primary metabolism, these are good bacteria. They keep our intestines healthy. This second population of bacteria is problematic because the secondary metabolites are what cause bloating, inflammation, weight gain, depression, and even cancer. And this makes sense. Think about when you feel bloated or inflamed. The colon is usually just storing and holding on to feces before expelling it. By the way, you can test this out. There is a way you can calculate intestinal transit time. It's called a follow-through study. You ingest some contrast dye, and then the radiologist takes some x-ray photos every few minutes. Usually at the end of four hours, the contrast reaches the colon. And then you can time how long it takes for you to have a bowel movement. Now, if you don't want to undergo a medical test, the simple way you can do this at home is to eat an entire beet or two and see how long it takes for your stool to turn red. If it happens within 12 to 24 hours, you're usually good. If it takes any longer, like two days or more, then you're probably in trouble and probably deal with a lot of bacterial overgrowth and inflammation. When you're first starting out, you wanna make sure that you're getting rid of the bad bacteria in your colon. And if doing that is a problem, you can take some milk of magnesia and try to have two to four liquid bowel movements a day for a couple of days. It will allow you to get a jump start on repopulating your gut with good bacteria. Think of it like removing weeds in the garden so you can make room for better things to grow. So that's the topic of intestinal transit time. And it's very important for controlling what types of bacteria live in our gut. It's also important to regulate inflammation. You can impact this by eating a lot of fiber and taking magnesium supplements when you get constipated. All right, I hope that you enjoyed that video. Who knew that fiber could do so much? And that's why foods that contain lots of fiber are considered superfoods because they help in so many ways decrease inflammation coming from the intestines. The same inflammation that triggers dysfunctional immune response when food lingers too long in the intestines. Now that you know about intestinal transit time, I wanna know what foods you would like to eat 
that contains substantial fiber? Let me know in the comments below. Also, if you like this video, help support my channel by sharing this video with someone you know, and be sure to subscribe for more useful tips on rheumatoid arthritis. This is Dr. Chanu Dasri with the MindGut Immunity Clinic, and I'll see you next time.